Our next presenter is Professor Charles J. If you look in your bio under J, you will not find it. It is spelled with a G. He is the John F. Kimberling Professor of Law at the Indiana University Morris School of Law. Quite simply, he is a judicial independence guru. He starts one of his recent books called Courting Peril with the sentence, in public discourse on the American judiciary, crisis rhetoric abounds, end quote. He offers recent events that might support the conclusion that the judiciary is on the brink, but then asserts that there is an alternate conclusion, quote, that the alarmists are making mountains out of molehills and should be sent home with a basket of bran muffins, end quote. <laughs> I think that sets the tenor for his discussion, but today he will sound an alarm that is real, namely, there are many challenges to judicial independence. Charlie J. Okay, so I am tickled pink to be here. Uh, I ordinarily I hate to read my presentations. The problem is I've got enough to say that uh, my concern is that I'm, I would go on, and I know that I am the only thing standing between you and lunch, and that if I exceed my time, you will try to hurt me. Uh, and so what I'm going to do instead is, fo is work more from script than I usually do. I should say that, that although I share many of the concerns of the previous panel about state judicial elections, and just finished a book about it earlier this year, I think that those problems have been with us for a while. And what I want to focus on today is more of the recent developments involved the federal courts, where you know, I, I think that, that my concerns have, become, have, have, have grown. I'm not in, in crisis rhetoric mode, but I think we do have some serious problems that, that warrant some attention. I've been asked to talk about the challenges to judicial independence, a topic that I want to talk about or tackle in three parts. Um, first, I want to talk about the structure of judicial independence. Uh, then I will discuss the history of judicial independence and the problems that have emerged in the later stages of that structure before turning third to the future of judicial independence and how we might address the problems that I've identified. Now, I conceptualize the judicial, judicial independence a little differently than some uh, in four tiers. And in that regard, uh, the work of Steve Burbank, who will be talking later, and his work on the architecture of independence have been, have been foundational to my thinking. Uh, but at the top of this tier is what I characterize it as an ancient rule of law paradigm that began with the ancient Greeks, died with the Romans, and was resurrected during the Enlightenment. Uh, in its most basic form, that paradigm proceeds from the premise that we have fundamental rights that are better protected by self-imposed laws than by autocrats. With respect to the role of the judiciary, it contemplates that, that courts will impartially uphold the law on a case-by-case -case basis, and to that end, judges must be afforded independence from external interference with their impartial judgment, so that they will uphold the law uncorrupted by extra-legal influences. The paradigm acknowledges the need to hold independent judges accountable uh, to the law, but in a limited way. Uh, limited largely to the strictures of the judge's conscience uh, the appellate pro and the appellate process, except where corruption or criminal conduct are involved. And to this day, the judiciary's role in the rule of law paradigm and the centrality of judicial independence to that role are repeated as a virtual mantra, punctuate, punctuating the point that a judge's policy preference exert no influence on judicial decision making. For example, Justice Breyer has written, judicial independence revolves around the theme of how to ensure that judges decide according to the law rather than according to their own whims or the will of the political branches of government. While Chief Justice Roberts said during his confirmation testimony that judges and justices are servants of the law, not the other way around. Judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. Article three in turn, sought to implement the rule of law in a paradigm in a rudimentary way. It established an, a separate judicial branch armed with the authority to exercise the judicial power and protected judges from external threats to their independent and impartial judgment by giving them tenure during good behavior and a salary that couldn't be cut. But the text left gaps. Nothing would seem to stop Congress from retaliating against judges for making unpopular rulings by impeaching them, cutting their budgets, disestablishing their courts, changing court size to alter their decision-making majority, withholding salary increases, or stripping the court's jurisdictional authority. And what if a president undermined court power and autonomy and authority by defying court orders? 
or using his bully pulpit to, dis to delegitimize the courts. To fill these gaps, we get to the third tier. Informal constitutional conventions emerged and evolved over time as a kind of political branch precedent to guide Congress and the president in their relationship with the courts in a manner consistent with the independent judiciary that was conceived in the rule of law paradigm and implemented by Article III. These political branch conventions have entrenched themselves over time to fill gaps and resolve uncertainties in the text of Article III, which taken together foster what I characterize as a custom of independence, customary judicial independence, that the political branches have, with exceptions, respected, which segues into a discussion of history, which I've divided, divided into four periods. Judicial independence 1.0, the period of establishment. Judicial independence 2.0, the period of evolution. Judicial independence 3.0, really beginning in the 20th century with a period of what I characterize as erosion, and perhaps more ominously than it should be characterized, judicial independence 4.0, a period of partial collapse. Now when it comes to the new, you know, the new judicial independence 1.0, and this now I'm going to sort of, in some ways this will be leftovers, you know, rewarmed from, from uh, uh, President, Dean, Judge, poker player Levy's presentation. Um, <laughs> the new English Americans aspired to establish a separate and independent judiciary. Before the revolution, they were unhappy that colonial judges were dependent on the crown and said so in the Declaration of Independence. After the revolution, they were unhappy that state judges were dependent on state legislatures. And so at the Constitutional Convention, they provided for tenure and salary guarantees for, for federal judges. These aspirations, however, were compromised by inattention. The founders were so focused on regulating the relationship between Congress and the president that they relegated the third branch to what one historian has described as little more than an honorable mention. The problem of inattention was exacerbated by inexperience. The framers were familiar with threats to judicial tenure and salaries, but had less practical experience with other political branch encroachments on the judiciary as a separate branch of government outside of the one Dean Levy alluded to this morning, which was resolved by establishing a separate judicial branch. That would change in 1801 with the first transition of political power in American history. The outgoing Federalists uh, passed the so-called Midnight Judges Act, which packed the court with 16 new judgeships that the incoming Jeffersonian Republicans promptly unpacked before embarking on a campaign to remove other Federalist judges by means of impeachment. For Senator William Giles, who was the cheerleader for the triumphant Jeff Jeffersonian Republicans, the lesson of this episode was, quote, the theory of three distinct departments of government is perhaps not critically correct, although it is obvious that the framers of our Constitution proceeded on this theory in its formation. For Giles, the Constitution authorized Congress to have its way with the judiciary and, remove, and, and authorized him to remove Federalist, federal judges, quote, indiscriminately. The separate and independent judiciary that the framers had aspired to establish in principle was on the brink of obliteration in, in practice. Which brings us then to judicial independence 2.0, which I describe as evolution. Ironically, the precedent Giles and his cohort set was, ended up being precedent to avoid rather than follow. Over the course of the next 150 years, during Judicial Independence 2.0, a series of conventions would emerge, evolve, and entrench to guide Congress and the President. These conventions operate as a kind of precedent against initiatives that undermine the independent judiciary envisioned by the prevailing rule of law paradigm, which the framers had aspired to protect in their Constitution. These conventions would be tested across cycles, anti cycles of anti-court sentiment following major transition of political power, when new regimes would seek to undermine the holdover judges of the old regime, and the traditionalists would rise up and defend the court from attack with recourse to increasingly established conventions. So, in 1804, after removing uh, Federalist Judge John Pickering by impeachment, a task made easier by the fact that he was not only a strident Federalist, but an insane alcoholic strident Federalist. <laughs> Congress would never again remove a judge for high-handed decision-making, despite more than 30 attempts in the intervening years. After repeal of the Midnight Judges Act, Congress would never again remove judges by disestablishing their judgeships. Congress would adjust the size of the Supreme Court over several years, but never again for openly partisan purposes, a convention that thwarted FDR in his attempt to pack the court during the New Deal. Similarly, 
Congress has never exploited its control of the judiciary's budget or salary increases to punish judges or hold them hostage. And after the Midnight Judges Act, never packed the court with a mass infusion of unnecessary judgeships for partisan gain. Finally, although the judicial confirmation process has always been partisan, the Senate and President have ad adopted procedural conventions like the filibuster, the blue, pr the blue slip, senatorial courtesy, and ABA review of, of candidate qualifications that encourage consultation, consensus, and compromise in judicial selection. Such conventions produced a judicial workforce that, with exceptions, enjoyed broad-based support, a workforce that, in the public's mind, could be trusted with its independence. Presidents, too, have followed uh, 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 constitutional conventions. With the exception of Abraham Lincoln, who broke from tradition amid the exigencies of the Civil War, no president has openly defied a direct Supreme Court order, a convention that one scholar has described as perhaps the most important convention of all. Sitting presidents have often criticized uh, uh, judicial rulings. But there is a convention against doing so by means of attacking the court's legitimacy or motives. Lincoln once implied that the Supreme Court had usurped power from the people, but he sandwiched that accusation between statements emphasizing his support for a counter-majoritarian court and respect for its rulings. The lone true exception was again FDR, whose campaign against the Supreme Court included accusations that it had, quote, improperly set itself up as a third branch House of Congress, close quote, for which reason, quote, we must take action to save the Constitution from the court and the court from itself. The resilience of customary independence embodied in these conventions is, in my judgment, attributable to the rule of law paradigm itself, which guided the formation of the Constitution and the conventions that emerged to fill gaps in the constitutional text consistent with the paradigm. Beginning in the 1920s, however, several developments began to challenge an assumption core to that paradigm, that in the, 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 the assumption being that independent judges can be trusted to impartially uphold the law. The legal realism movement of the 1920s argued that empirical study was essential to understanding the choices judges made because those choices could not be explained with reference to operative law alone. In the 1940s, political scientists began to develop what would later become known as the attitudinal model of judicial decision making, which posited that the choices Supreme Court justices made are influenced less by their law, the law than by their ideological preferences. And in that regard, a, land, a landmark article uh, written by Dean Ruger or co-authored by Dean Ruger is really sort of one of the, one of the later efforts in that, in that series. And the, fed, the federal judicial appointments process was evolving on a parallel track as the role of nominee ideology in their future decision making became an increasing focus of Senate confirmation proceedings throughout the 20th century, culminating in the 1986 rejection of nominee Robert Bork on ideological grounds alone. Nakedly partisan disputes over nominee ideology then percolated down to circuit and district court confirmations where longstanding procedural uh, conventions, which had been used to promote deliberation, com consensus, and compromise, were now repurposed to sandbag the nominations of judges deemed activists or extremists. Beginning in the 1970s, a new politics of judicial elections, which you have heard a snootful of from the last panel, morphed into state Supreme Court races, morphed state Supreme Court races into well-funded campaigns to remove incumbents for making unacceptable decisions. Campaigns which proceeded from the premise that independent judges could not be trusted to impartially uphold the law and needed to be controlled at the ballot box. And I think in that regard, footnote to the tireless efforts of Lynn Marks and the others on the previous panel in that way. In a series of developments spanning more than a generation, the media became apostles for the gospel of an ideological judiciary. The traditional media began to report on Supreme Court decisions with reference to the ideological voting blocks of the justices and the majority in dissent. Cable and television news networks oriented their programming toward ideologically driven infotainment that attacked or defended the ide ideological tilt of Supreme Court decisions. Citizen journalists, unencumbered by fact-checking norms that regulate the mainstream media, took to the internet and social media to attack judicial decisions they deemed ideologically unacceptable. Now, survey data show that public, the public shares the views animating Judicial Independence 3.0, a point amplified by the survey Judge Rendell summarized this morning. 
Significant majorities believe that judges are influenced by their ideologies. And I do want to make one kind of important sort of line of demarcation. Annenberg did a study a few years ago which said that 75% of judges, of, of respondents believe that judges are influenced by their ideologies. For, we now have, a, a, this, this latest figure is 50% say judges can't set aside their politics when deciding cases. I think those are two different issues. One is to what extent is ideology, ideology influencing and to what extent are they consciously being partisans. I think those are two different things to be, be thinking about, and, and I'll get there uh, in, in, in a bit. And while judge, and there's another data point coming from the Maxwell School, a significant majority says that while judges say they are following the law, they often act on their personal feelings or beliefs. Public support of the Supreme Court seemingly remains stable and strong, but there are signs that that support is increasingly contingent that liberal and conservative support for the Supreme Court swings with the latest rulings and the appointing president. And indeed, the recent uptick in support for the court seems to have come from conservatives, as reported by Annenberg. These developments show an emerging skepticism of a principal core to the long-standing rule of law paradigm, that independent judges hold extra-legal influences at bay and impartially uphold the law. Over time, the public has simply you know, ceased to believe at some level when judges, when they say that they follow the law and nothing but. If judges impose their ideological policy preferences, the argument goes, why should they be independent from political controls when other policymakers are not? In other words, this slow period of erosion culminates in the suspicion that when judges say we're all about the law and nothing else, no, 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 your nose is growing. I mean, hence the thrust of this cartoon. In the past three, in the, which brings us to 4.0. In the past three years, erosion has yielded to a partial collapse in what I denominate judicial independence 4.0, with a neo-populist wave that has swept more than 40 nations around the world, including the United States. There are several causes contributing to this neo-populist movement. One I would characterize as a kind of democracy fatigue. The percentage of Americans who trust the federal government all or most of the time has declined from 77% at the beginning of the Johnson administration to 17% today, which may help to, expo ex to explain gradual declines in support for the Supreme Court over time. In other words, to the extent that support for the court has declined over time, it may have less to do with what the court is doing than what su uh, support for government generally is. A second contributing cause is the ascendance of anti-elitism. The data show that support for populist, man-of-the-people leaders is driven by disdain and distrust for professionals, intellectuals, and experts, including scientists, journalists, and career government officials. The implications of these anti-elitist sentiments, sentiments for highly educated, life-tenured professionals who sit aloft on benches judging people is obvious enough. <laughs> A third contributing cause is political polarization. The degree to which average, this is a kind of interesting point that I didn't expect to find. The, the degree to which average Americans have been polarized along ideological lines has remained pretty stable since the 1970s. But our political leaders have become much more polarized ideologically, and average Americans have become much more affectively polarized. Uh, in, their, uh, in their hatred or dislike for members of the opposing political party, even though their spread on ideological issues remains more or less unchanged. Neo-populist leaders have exploited these divisions by exacerbating them and pitting themselves and their, uh, and their cohort against their opponents whom they demonize. In a forthcoming book, two political scientists show that in highly polarized times, there is, you know, the public is especially receptive to court curbing uh, measures to control the other side's judges. So, voter distrust of experts and disaffection for government as usual correlate with a desire for a stronger, more autocratic leader who can wrest control uh, of, uh, who can wrest control from elites and reclaim the government in the people's name. Once elected, neo-populist leaders across the world have consolidated power by weakening institutional checks on their authority via, among other strategies, stifling dissent within their own political parties, discrediting the media, and of particular importance here, weakening the judiciary. President Trump, among others, has ridden a populist wave into power. Aided by a supportive Senate 
He has challenged the judiciary's authority in the teeth of long-standing conventions to the contrary, and some of those conventions have begun to yield. Procedural conventions in judicial confirmation proceedings have collapsed. In 2016, as you know, Senate Republicans denied Supreme Court nominee Merrick Garland a hearing that he would customarily receive. They repudiated the Blue Slip Convention. They ended the filibuster option in Supreme Court confirmation proceedings six years after Senate Democrats did the same for lower court nominees. Finally, President Trump eliminated the American Bar Association's pre-nomination role in vetting judicial candidates. And, in the, and while that is also true of President Bush, they retained an important role in, in the Bush administration. Um, in this case, however, uh, in the years since, an unprecedented number of ABA unqualified judges had been non nominated and confirmed, a departure from the tradition that Mr. Hine described in the preceding, in his, in, in his presentation earlier. Conventions against court packing have likewise come under fire. In 2017, Federalist Society Chairman Stephen Calabrese co-authored a memo to both houses of Congress proposing that Congress double the size of the federal appellate judiciary for the explicit purpose of packing the circuit courts with conservative judges to neutralize the impact of Obama-era appointments. Democratic leaders, in turn, have responded in, time, in, in kind, proposing to pack the U.S. Supreme Court with additional justices if and when the Democrats return to power. The president has repudiated the convention against delegitimizing rhetoric, challenging the judiciary of the, the, the legitimacy of the federal court rulings, and questioning the motives of judges involved across an array of tweets and other public statements, of which you are familiar enough that I'm not going to need to quote chapter and verse. Finally, the convention against defiance of court orders was placed in doubt when the press widely reported that the president was thinking about adding a citizenship question to the 2020 sentence, census by executive order in defiance of a recent Supreme Court decision. That threat did not materialize, but it would be naive to think that the prospect of defiance does not remain a live concern with the number of active pieces of litigation in play. The collapse of independence conventions in Judicial Independence 4.0 was facilitated by what I've described earlier as a protracted erosion of support for the role of judicial independence in the rule of law paradigm in 3.0 that made uh, you know, 4.0 possible, when a series of developments in 3.0 challenged the premise core to the paradigm, that independent judges set extra legal influences aside and impartially uphold the law. One possibility is to shrug, let judicial independence collapse under its own weight, and welcome a judiciary that is more responsive to partisan and majoritarian pressures. That response would make sense if judicial independence is to blame for its own undoing. But in my view, the problem does not lie with judicial independence itself, but with how judicial independence is conceptualized in the rule of law paradigm. The long-term solution, then, is not to jettison judicial independence, but to tweak the guiding paradigm. And here's what I have in mind. The tweak I propose begins from the premise that judges are embedded in a well-established legal culture that takes law seriously beginning in law school and continuing in practice, hence the name judicial uh, 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 legal culture paradigm. Academics love to name things. I mean, in reality, this is a modest revision of what I think we already embrace in, in the rule of law paradigm. And the, the premise here is that judges take law seriously, and when they announce to the world that they are doing their best to uphold the law, that is what they are acculturated to do. That is God's honest truth. Second. Likewise, beginning in law school and continuing in practice, future judges are exposed to pervasive legal indeterminacy. Law students learn to exploit indeterminacy by arguing both sides of difficult legal questions, divorced from their own policy preferences, to the end of making them more effective advocates in an adversarial system of justice. Third, future judges, again beginning as law students, resolve indeterminate legal questions with reference to competing policy arguments that aid them in deciding which of two comparably plausible interpretations of law is best. When judges are called upon to decide indeterminate legal questions with reference to competing policy arguments, the argument they find most persuasive can be informed by their background, their education, their life experience, their common sense, and their policy perspective, aided by a strategic sense of the political context in which the case arose. That is not judging gone rogue. That is judging gone right. And that's, I think, sort of one of the messages of both uh, Professor uh, Dean Ruger and, uh, Profe uh, and uh, President Levy earlier. 
Judicial independence in this context, where we are for the first time acknowledging, rather than pretending it doesn't exist, these extra legal influences play a role, the judicial independence nonetheless remains critical in this, in this revised paradigm. In easy cases, when the law is clear, which is a lot of the time, judicial independence enables judges to uphold and apply the law as they have been acculturated to do throughout their legal careers without fear or favor clouding their judgment. In hard cases, where the law is indeterminate and judges must choose between comparably plausible interpretations, there is no denying that choices judges make can affect legal policy. But the policy is case-driven. The outcome turns on the application of facts and law with which judges are uniquely familiar by virtue of the adversarial process, which supplies judges with the specifics needed to make an informed decision. Judicial independence thus positions a judge to give us her best assessment of what the applicable facts and law are, unpolluted by external threats or manipulations, an assessment that the judge is uniquely situated and, and fully acculturated to make. If this is policy making, it is fully informed, fact-driven policy making that is better to, uh, suited to achieve just results on a case-by-case -case basis than if the judge was subject to the control of actors who are less familiar with the facts and law and are concerned only with the outcome of the matter. The virtue of a legal culture paradigm is that it defends an independent judiciary in terms that social science verifies and the public can accept. The public understands that, you know, 75% of them, the judges are subject to these influences uh, and respects the judiciary nevertheless. We have a 70% approval rating. Um, and I think the problem that I'm trying to address is the problem of pretending that we just call balls and strikes. Uh, when it is more complicated than that, and the public is, I think, able to handle that truth. And when we say that it's not so, I think we engender a kind of suspicion we're trying to get past. But by honestly acknowledging the role that extra legal influences can play in judicial decision making, the legal culture paradigm has to concede, concede the possibility of gratuitous po policy making in some cases, in which judges abuse their independence by disregarding the law that they are acculturated to follow, knowingly or not, and imposing their own policy predilections. Accordingly, the legal culture paradigm needs to envision a more robust role for accountability relative to the rule of law paradigm to deter that kind of gratuitous policy making and preserve public confidence. Without disputing the role that Congress plays in promoting accountability, the additional accountability that the legal culture paradigm envisions can be supplied in large part by intrajudicial mechanisms already in place that pose no meaningful threat to judicial independence. Indeed, the judiciary already self-regulates in myriad ways, and again, footnote to Burbank, to police gratuitous policy making and the biases that animate in a bunch of different ways. One, through appellate review of errors, which can include biased-induced errors. Two, mandamus actions to thwart judicial usurpations of power. Three, disqualification processes that force the withdrawal of judges whose impartiality is in doubt. Four, procedural rules that structure and limit problematic exercises of judicial discretion. And in that regard, I think we might think about tweaking Twombly and Iqbal. The Code of Conduct for U.S. Judges, which regulates judicial partiality and partisan judicial conduct. Six, the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, where Congress authorizes circuit judicial councils to discipline judges for behavior prejudicial to the effective administration of the courts, including bias and har harassment, thanks in no small part to Judge Sirica, who will be talking uh, to you later. Seven, the oath of office, which calls upon judges to act impartially and uphold the U.S. Constitution. And eight, last but certainly not least, informal norms among the judges themselves who are desirous of mutual respect on collegial courts which discourages openly partisan ju judging as contrary to their rule of law mission. By better promoting the relevance of these mechanisms to judicial accountability and reforming them to better serve their purpose, the judiciary can go a long way, I think, toward preserving its autonomy in the transition to this modified rule of law paradigm. Turning finally to the sort of the short term, that's sort of the long term, and it's really part of an evolving conversation. Implementing this proposed legal culture paradigm might help meet the challenge presented by eroding support over 100 years, but it is inadequate to the task of overcoming the threat to the constitutional order posed by judicial independence 4.0. That is because the legal culture paradigm depends for its success, as does the rule of law paradigm, 
on preserving customary independence by respecting constitutional conventions that are being trashed in the service of dueling campaigns to promote or thwart the neo-populist wave that is sweeping the United States and much of the world in Judicial Independence 4.0. It is unrealistic to hope that a modest reboot of the prevailing paradigm can by itself quiet the polarized partisan political fury, firing Judicial Independence 4.0 because the judiciary and its independence have become little more than pawns subject to sacrifice in a chess game for the future of American democracy. Throughout American history, there have been cycles of anti-court anger following major transitions of political power. The first two cycles of the 20th century were related. The conservative Supreme Court's substantive due process jurisprudence thwarted the legislative agenda of angry progressives as they ascended to power in the early 20th century, just as the same jurisprudence impeded and, in, and infuriated the New Dealers a generation later. The end of that, this latter cycle, punctu was punctuated in part by the Supreme Court's famous footnote in, uh, for in Caroline Products, where the court signaled its intention to reserve heightened due process scrutiny for cases in which legislation and other state action impinged upon the rights of discrete and insular minorities. The net effect of this pivot was to withdraw the court from protecting the rights of businesses by second-guessing the wisdom of socioeconomic legislation enacted by uh, historically liberal-leaning legislatures and shift the court's focus toward protecting the civil rights and civil liberties of political minorities against infringement by majoritarian and often more conservative state interests. As a consequence of this shift, the next three cycles of anti-court sentiment featured angry conservatives taking aim at more liberal courts, including attacks on the Warren Court by state and federal officials in the 1960s, the Congressional Republican campaign against liberal judicial activism following their ascension to power in 1994, and most recently, President Trump's ongoing effort to discredit political, deci political decision making by Obama judges. In these conservative campaigns against liberal judges, Republicans have made recreating the courts as conservative champions of judicial restraint a centerpiece of their agenda. Democrats, in contrast, have adopted a more passive and defensive approach. They came to regard the federal courts as allies in the cause of protecting the rights that liberals held dear, and instead of campaigning aggressively to establish a liberal court per se, they joined moderates in defending the judiciary's independence from cyclical conservative backlash. The net effect has been a manifestation of what some scholars call asymmetric constitutional hardball, in which conservatives have, with exceptions, tested the limits of independence conventions more aggressively than their liberal counterparts. But, and it's a big but, judicial independence 4.0 may be a game changer. This cycle may be different. Progressives are awakening to the realization that their conservative adversaries are poised to win a generations-long battle for ideological control of the Supreme Court. Sensing a major jurisprudential regime change, progressives show signs of returning to their roots and launching an offensive in the spirit of their forebears from the progressive and New Deal era, most notably reflect reflected in proposals to pack the Supreme Court. For those of us who regard constitutional conventions as essential to the orderly operation of government and who see merit in customary independence and the conventions that animate it, we must brace for a future that will get worse before it gets better. Pokes to the eye of established conventions by conservative partisans will elicit reciprocal, reciprocal pokes by progressive partisans in lieu of unheeded warnings not to poke at all. This eye-for-an-eye eye stratagem is very much in the spirit of high-stakes litigation, where the parties push the limits of applicable rules in scorched-earth campaigns to exhaust and intimidate their opponents in pursuit of tactical advantage. In this environment, calls for compromise, for detente, will almost certainly go unheeded. And so I anticipate that scorched-earth tactics will dominate in the short term. Ultimately, however, Hardball litigation is exhausting. Running a government without guiding conventions is chaotic, and therein lies hope. The more insufferable unrestrained hardball gets, the more attractive the alternative of settlement becomes. A key to enabling settlement is to bring the parties together in a quieter and less formal setting to promote candor and discourage posturing for the benefit of external audiences. Beginning in the late 1970s, the Brookings Institution hosted a series of conferences in Williamsburg, Virginia, and elsewhere. 
Those conferences brought representatives of all three branches of government together to discuss court-related issues for the purpose of improving interbranch communication and promoting mutual understanding uh, and challenges confronting the judiciary. And so I look forward to a time when we can convene a series of tri-branch summits in the spirit of the Williamsburg conferences once the adversaries are willing and receptive to meet. These summits could address such topics as the role of an independent and accountable judiciary in American government, the state of constitutional conventions that have served to protect an independent judiciary from encroachment, and the need for procedural conventions and the appointments process to promote a stable system of selection and an independent, accountable judiciary. It's premature to convene these summits until the populist wave is crested and the disputants are prepared to meet and listen. There is, however, room for optimism that the current appeal of the biblical edict, an eye for an eye, will eventually yield to the wisdom of Mahatma Gandhi's admonition that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had a, a bit of everything this morning. I think we mixed it up. Uh, so this is time for kind of the wrap up and the what I call the action agenda before we go up to lunch. And I should note that lunch is up in the Levy Conference Center, which is two flights up. Uh, this room will not be locked, so if you have valuables that you want to take with you, that's fine. Uh, we have kind of a tight uh, schedule, so I'd urge you after this uh, to make your way up to Levy. Lunches will be on the tables. Just sit down and help yourself, and then we'll begin our dialogue with Paul Clement and Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, but we have uh, with this conference what I call an action agenda. <coughs> Most conferences, you spend the day, you learn a lot, you leave and you go about your business and you, you might think again a little bit about the topic, but you don't do anything. Well, that's not what I want to do. We're going we're gonna to have an action agenda and this afternoon, probably right before the break, you all will receive an email because okay. we have your email addresses. Uh, that proposes several things that you could do within the next year to either... It did seem familiar. It's like an acid flashback right there. Oh. <laughs> Somebody's mic is still on. <laughs> Maybe they're commenting on my action agenda and pushing back. I don't know. In any event, you'll be receiving an email um, that proposes several things that you could do to pass along what you've learned today or to react to something that you see in the news that implicates judicial independence. Perhaps you see a headline in a paper talking about a case and you realize the case really wasn't about that and you want to write an op-ed piece or you want to go and speak at a class or you want to invite a candidate to come into your home if you're running for the Supreme Court or whatever. Um, you can pick. You can pick from among these or put in your own idea of what you might do. Included in the list uh, is to volunteer for the Rendell Center. <laughs> I think students, you can do that. Uh, or host a judge chat. And what that is at the, the courthouse here in Philadelphia, we have the National Constitution Center across the street. And whenever a, a class of, of students comes in, uh, they ask, when a will a judge come over and conduct a chat? And very often the class is really want this and we go over and the kids ask questions, really, really good questions usually, although they ask me whether I know Judge Judy. <laughs> but I said no, but I know Chief Justice Roberts and that's much more important in your lives, you should realize. Um, in any event, uh, there's going to be an action agenda and we're going to follow up, we're going to ask you to do something in the next year and probably in eight or nine months if we hadn't heard back from you, we're going to prod you. Uh, but you can select what you want to do. There will also be three survey questions uh, about today's program for you to give us your, your feedback uh, and maybe a takeaway thought uh, from the program. So we'll remind you again, but that should come on your, uh, with, to your email at around 3 o'clock this afternoon. So that said, I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. Make your way up to leave.